I said it before and I'll say it again. That video gets me every time. Gets me joyed for talking about technology, talking about tech. And today we're going to talk about serverless functions. Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm joined here. My name is Corey. I'm a cloud advocate based in Stockholm and I'm joined by Sandro. How are you, Sandro? Thanks, Corey. I'm quite fine. How about you? Yeah, good, good. So I would love to know where everyone is sort of joining from. That's my favorite question. But also, what's your favorite programming language? Even if it's still not, not the programming language that you normally use, but uh, you know, we can build what we're talking about now, serverless functions and many different programming languages. So it's, it'd be good to know uh, where everyone's coming about. I know Sandra has some um, demos and uh, examples he's going to show us later on. But uh, yeah, you know, let us know what, where you're joining from. Uh, what your favorite programming language is or when you're trying to learn because uh, I'm always looking for new new ways and new things to educate people. So uh, that would be really cool. Oh, yes, Capron. Yes, straight with it, Rust. So yeah, Rust is one of my <laughs> my favorite. Not using it full time yet, uh, but I'm so happy to have you have a, have a Rust developer, a Rust fan at least, uh, joining the call. I, I think uh, there's got... no Rust version for Azure Functions. Not yet, right not yet, not, not yet, not yet. Yes. So maybe Soon they though. should think about that. Yeah, C Sharp from Israel, and from Israel all the way to C Sharp from India. So look at that, nice connection. Got some C Sharp developers uh, from London. Okay, favorite languages. So you've got two. You can only have one favorite, James. <laughs> Just joking. So uh, Python and PowerShell, I guess. So Python, I can feel, is what you really love. Uh, and then Capron from Sweden, Russ from Sweden, love it. Yeah, it's basically me. I'm Russ from Sweden too. Uh, we got it's UK from Java, so Java development, nice, nice. Sweden, AL Business Central. I'm not sure, is that Business Central is a language? Gert, you can tell me, I'm not sure. I don't want to like anger the Business Central community. Uh, Kotlin, cool, nice. Sri Lanka. Oh my God, I love Sri Lanka as a country. I've been there, uh, I was there for a few years ago for like a month and a half. It's a beautiful country, beautiful people. So I'm glad you're joining us. And from San Antonio, so quite a good crowd. San, San Antonio to Sri Lanka, to Israel, to uh, India. Uh, and all of the, almost all of the popular languages there. Uh, and AL is the language. Sorry, Bert, Kurt. So now I know, BC is the ERP pod from Microsoft, as I should know, working at Microsoft, but... That's good. Now we learned something new. So Sandra, what else are we going to uh, learn today? Uh, You're going to tell us about Azure Serverless Functions. And we're going to um, have a lot of questions coming in. Um, so we have set up, we're going to try to answer everything uh, that you have asked us. But we do have this link later on. Uh, we'll show that to the, the link as well. But if you, if we, you have a question now, uh, feel free to ask us throughout the whole, the whole workshop. Uh, but if you, let's say you have a question we don't get to, or you know, a few hours from now you have a question about serverless, uh, feel free to drop go to this link, serverless ask, and we have a nice little tech community, which is basically like a pilot program on just kind of making this digital experience more in person, kind of. You know, you know how if you have go to a workshop, you can ask the speaker after a question, but you can't really ask us. I mean, we'll send our links later on our social links, but uh, you know you might have something later on that you want to ask. So just drop through to that link and um, we will uh, try to answer anything around serverless that you have, or you can give me some great tips on uh, Sri Lanka traveling tips. That'd be great too. <laughs> cool, Sandra. So serverless, what is that all about? Take it away. Okay, thanks. Then I guess I just share my screen. Uh, yeah, we, will tr we should have practiced this before. Um, so yeah, if you go share, make... present. Um, but I think and then you can see my entire second screen. Yeah, we can see your entire second screen. Okay, uh, great. Base code. Perfect. And now you should see the, the PowerPoint slides. Love it. So then let's start with our first serverless function workshop. Welcome, guys, girls, non-binary pals, uh, also from my side officially now. My name is Sandro, as Corey already introduced me. I am Gold, Microsoft Learn Student Ambassador, and here in uh, Germany, I'm working as a research assistant and PhD student at the University of Stuttgart. 
besides of that, I'm a huge Raccoon fan, which Corey obviously is not. And Sandra, I'm not sure how many Raccoons have you seen in real life, but uh, I'm just going to say they're not as cute as the one on that photo. Um, so I am not a yes, massive fan. Yes, of course. <laughs> I have seen some. But unfortunately, in our location here, there are not so many around. So in the middle of Germany, they are more a, a plague. But here they are cute. Okay, so let's start with the, with the talk. Um, here again is the link. Also, via a QR code, if you prefer asking via mobile device. And before we dive deeper into Azure functions themselves, I want to give you a brief motivation towards the idea of serverless itself. So maybe we travel back some, some years ago in history, maybe at the beginning of 2000. Um, back then, applications often were quite a mess. So you had this um, the, these pile of mud applications where everything is strictly coupled, your spaghetti code, and the entire application is uh, built as a single one deployed on a single server. We have different developers and operators. The operators take care of the deployment and operate the infrastructure itself. And the developers usually, hopefully, implement the application. And for obvious reasons, applications like that are not so good in maintenance because of all the spaghetti code. So then people decided it might be a better idea to modularize that. Um, so we have these separation of concerns. So we have single modules for, for each, let's say, business task but we still had something which is called a monolith. Maybe some people also call this already a monolith because of the modules. Um, so one single application run on a sig single uh, infrastructure server, virtual machine, whatever. And usually also the divided tasks and stakeholders from developers and operators. And then in around 2005, 6, 7, and so on, the term of service-oriented architecture and, and component-based architectures became more popular. The idea there was dividing our single application into multiple small applications which communicate with each other over the internet, for example. Um, so nowadays we call this microservices, which is more or less a more specialized version of service-oriented architectures. And the idea is that each of those applications has only a single responsibility. So we have a red one, a green one, a blue one, and this yellow orange one. Um, they can use different technologies. They can be deployed maybe on the same infrastructure, but more often they are deployed on different infrastructures. Usually the infrastructure is virtualized, so we usually don't deploy on a bare metal server itself because we're talking here about cloud. And it happens that in those applications, sometimes we have functions which are more or less rarely invoked, but if they're invoked, maybe they're invoked multiple times or something like this. Um, well, I've got a question strange. about that, Sandra. Yeah, sure. With the, is there like a, like a scientific or like an actual quantity of what, what defines a rarely invoked function? Or is that within kind of deciding from the team itself uh, of when, what a function fits into that category? I mean, designing the architecture of such an application is a challenging task. Often some, oh, the other direction, some monolith approaches are even better than the microservice approach at the beginning, at least first. Um, so sometimes you also 
you don't really know upfront when you're building the application how often the the functions will be invoked so you have to to trace requests to find that out um, i don't think there's a real scientific definition of such rarely invoked functions um, yeah at the end it's the decision of the, the development team and the software architect how to structure the architecture that makes sense and also sometimes if these decisions are suboptimal maybe even bad um, so then the architecture performs also quite bad should we continue or is there yeah, let's do it. Okay. And let us know if you have any questions as we go on. Like I said, it's not a, uh, oh, we're done presenting now. Please ask questions. Anytime you have something. Yeah, sure. Up in your Please head. feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, yeah, what, what changed else? So before we had this developer stakeholder, which is usually a team, not a single person, and the, the operator stakeholder, which again is usually a team. And over the last decade, there, the, this term DevOps became more popular. The idea of DevOps is that we combine both different stakeholders in one, let's say, person. But again, we're talking about teams. And this, this DevOps team, everyone has the responsibility to develop and operate. So the entire team is not only developing the, the application, but also deploying it on, on some infrastructure, operating it there, maintaining the infrastructure, um, which can be quite cumbersome. And all those distributed systems are super complex. They can have different technologies. They can communicate via different protocols and, and technologies. So it's getting more and more complicated the more distributed our application is, especially in terms of various technologies. OK, let's um, continue. So usually, we don't have this, this one application instance. For example, here, the green one, which is a single point. Um, but we can have multiple. So we combine them on a service level. But at the end, we have multiple instances. So for the, the callee, it looks like there is only one green application. And the callee always calls this. But if we have a huge workload, so for example, we have the, the Black Friday upcoming. And then many, many people go on Amazon ordering some stuff like headphones, whatever, so Microsoft notebooks. Yeah, of course. Uh, so the workload might be increasing, especially for short-term um, special offers. And then the, the single instance is very, very busy. And the response times are quite slow. People become unhappy. Maybe they switch from Amazon to another web shop. I don't know which other one exists. Uh, maybe you know better. Um, but there's a solution, so we don't only have this one instance, but we have multiple instances which can be dynamically orchestrated and deployed, which means we, we create virtual infrastructures at runtime, depending on our workload, and also automatically deploy the instance there automatically, because this has to be done quite fast. I mean, usually we don't want to wait five minutes until the DevOps team woke up in the middle of the night, went through uh, to the PC, and then started some, some scripts. And uh, additionally, we need to build uh, another technology up front, which we call load balancer. And the idea of this load balancer is just that for every single incoming request, the load balancer decides to which of those application instances the request is rerouted and then uh, consumed. Uh, so this entire scenario here is uh, 
quite complex also infrastructure wise because you need to have different experiences and, and skills for different uh, architecture and uh, not architectures infrastructures you need to automate a lot um, and stuff with increasing popularity of the the cloud native term where we build and deploy applications distributed applications across maybe single cloud providers maybe even hybrid cloud providers all these technologies are uh, popping up like like blossoms in spring um, this is only a small set so we have maybe docker for containers we have kubernetes as orchestration runtime to run containers for instance docker you can have uh, you can use chef or or terraform or puppet to automate these deployments uh, you can run stuff on virtual machines like the machines in Azure or from some other provider, which I don't name here. Of course not. <laughs> Otherwise, I get beaten up maybe. And many, many more. I think there are 20, 30, maybe 100 different technologies which DevOps engineers might require to be at least to some degree skilled in. And every year, 10 more pop up. So now this, this huge amount of technologies results in a constant need to, to focus on learning these technologies for infrastructure. And as developers, we prefer that we, we don't have so much in common with, so we don't have to do so much stuff with infrastructure. We want to focus on, on developing our application. Usually people like that more. It's, more interesting to talk about the domains we're implementing for and not discussing whether a, a virtual machine or a Docker container is more fitted or how we can automate the scaling of those applications. And there comes the idea of serverless. So instead of managing our infrastructure ourselves, we use some, some magical service which does behind our, our responsibility, our, our back, all the orchestration of the infrastructure and scaling and stuff like that. So actually we don't care anymore. So usually there are some questions after that when we talk about this magic and, and you can also see here's no infrastructure symbol anymore. We, we only care about the the application to implement it, uh, then usually people ask some questions, for example, whether this means that we do not have any server at all. Um, also, if we don't have any server, are then my operation problems gone? How do I manage hardware requirements? Because different applications might have different hardware requirements. Maybe some machine learning application needs a lot of, uh, memory and, and GPU clusters, maybe another application part uses a lot of computing power on, on the CPU. And actually where does my application runs on now? If we don't have the server anymore, um, what happens if my application does need more hardware resources? How to manage that? And for obvious reasons, our application has to run somewhere. So to answer the question whether we do not have any server at all, no, of course, we do have a server, which we don't manage ourselves. And basically, this means we care about the server less. So serverless, haha. Uh -huh. um, Great and... marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank and the, the cloud provider is taking care about uh, care of the server and all the infrastructure deployment, orchestration, scaling, redeployment if something breaks, stuff like that. Um, yeah, so the basic idea is that we hand over responsibilities we do not want to manage ourselves 
to the cloud provider, uh, for instance. And there are usually these type of pictures where we have those layers, hardware, virtualization, operating system, container, runtime, application, and function. And this is done for infrastructure as service, uh, software as a service, and function as a service. We can have this these operation, uh, the DevOps managed parts and the service provider managed parts. And now the question is for infrastructure as a service. Maybe you know the term if you worked a bit with cloud computing and also software as a service and function as a service. How much of these layers, how many of these layers are managed by the cloud provider or service provider and how many are managed by the DevOps? So this is also a question towards the audience. Maybe we wait one minute. What, what's the, how can we do this? Is it all, um, nothing, um, some, what, what are the options you think? Yeah, may, maybe you can, we do it first for infrastructure as a service. Yeah. Maybe you can write down the, the term where you think Stop what is it? Stop. The part where the where the DevOps team has to manage themselves. So, for example, if we would say, "Hey, infrastructure as a service" means that the DevOps team has to manage the runtime and everything above, then you can write down chat runtime. Okay, we will give some time for people to guess this. So, and I always promise as a gift or a prize for the, the right answer is a strong handshake for me, uh, digital handshakes only. Uh, but while we wait for someone to guess here, uh, we see there's some people, let's see. So Bradfield, I asked the audience if they have already kind of deployed a service functions or Bradfield, not yet, planning to give it a go. So hopefully maybe after this, after this we'll feel a little bit more confident. And hey, Unscripted it has uh, started implementing in one of the applications. So that's nice to see. Uh, it's definitely, Getting something growing in popularity, as you mentioned. And kudos to you, Sandro. You was well phrased that the server lists, or we just care about the server less. So well done. So we'll see. Thanks. No one's no one's guessed yet. No one's trying to take the risk here. Uh, but let us know then. Uh, what's the answer? Okay, then we show the results. Oh, yeah. So basically, from left to right. Uh, the DevOps team has to manage less. For infrastructure as a service, you, you buy from the cloud provider a virtualized version of some infrastructure. Maybe um, you can say, okay, here are Azure virtual machines or something like that. And you then manage everything else yourself. For software as a service, you can have this on, on the container level. Um, so you don't have to to care of the take care of the the operation operating system, and the idea for function as a service or serverless itself, you only care about the application and everything below is uh, managed by the service provider himself or herself themselves. Um, yeah. Cool. We got so a question. We, we, yeah, sure. I'm not sure if we you know this one, but. Um, so how do we connect serverless to our VMs on a VNet, like a virtual network? Um, I'm not sure whether I get the question right, but the idea for serverless is that you get a service within, for example, Microsoft Azure Cloud, and there you have some let's say you have an interface to deploy your application. So you upload your application. Maybe you have some automation with GitHub uh, actions or whatever. And then your serverless application or database or, or function in this case is managed within this cloud service. And the cloud service takes care of running the function. So the function itself does not relate to, to virtual machines and you also cannot control them. So by handing over this responsibility to the provider, you also lose some, uh, some options, let's put it that way. You still can say, okay, I want to 
to have some quality assurance, whatever, uh, some scaling within different uh, criteria. But you cannot control virtual machines. You cannot connect to the virtual machine itself. What you can do is connecting your serverless application to another uh, to another application which runs on AVM. Cool, that makes sense. Yeah, I think um, there's a there's assuming uh, the function app is connected to a VM service like a DB or another API. But I think you kind of addressed that in your your uh, answer there, and then Craig came in as well and asked about well mentioned the functions kind of placed between the resource uh, and the database, if you will. I mean, the function itself is it's just a very very small application. Let's put it yeah, that way. that's a good way to put it. I think with, yeah, with one single responsibility. So basically, imagine you you're writing some source code and then you have this one operation within your Kotlin, Java, Python application. And you can ex exclude this, this one function, this one operation into a separate application. Maybe this operation is even shared between different other applications, then it makes sense in particular, because otherwise you have code duplicates. Um, but it's like a very, very small application. And this application can be connected to databases, which we will cover later in our demo. Um, so you can store items in a database. You can read items from a database. But in general, you can do nearly everything within a function, which you could also do within a normal application. Yeah, I think that's like the main, get the, getting that main concept down and the, the ideas there. Um, I want to give James a, a, a virtual handshake, or there we go, because he did guess right, uh, at least on the infrastructure of a service, that everything lower than the OS was um, managed by the service provider. So good job, James. Sorry, it was a little delayed, but uh, it's still right. So we'll give you the points. OK, are there any other questions, or should we continue? I think we're good to go. OK, so then I have a small flashback so we have these rarely invoked functions maybe it's bad that i didn't think earlier <laughs> about that maybe these functions are in different applications even so we want to exclude them anyhow um, and the idea now is to to really extract this function as an independent application and since we don't want to run everything with infrastructure, especially since it's rarely invoked, um, we try to do this as serverless app. So the question here would be if we would have an architecture like that, where we have an, an application running on an infrastructure, and then we have this function running on a serverless infrastructure. Uh, whether we so the question is whether we do need to have this infrastructure the function runs on orchestrated at all times so does there uh, does the service this VM whatever runs all the time even though the function is idling because it's not called or whether we can shut down the, the thing completely because on the left side maybe different operations of the, the yellow orange application are called regularly. Uh, so this application has to be running all the time. It requires maybe fast response time. Um, and since the application has to run all the time, also the infrastructure has to be orchestrated all the time. Um, so yeah, they, maybe, everyone, I think everyone got that point. Uh, there was okay. a couple of no's. I don't know if you saw there, <laughs> Craig and uh, Hey Unscripted okay, also great. mentioned. No, they, they get the point. We don't need to uh, have this running all of the time. Only when we need to perform it, as I mentioned. Good. Uh, so only when we need it. And basically, this is the idea of serverless functions. So we have 
small units of code bundled as functions. Um, we upload them on a platform where they are executed and we have this on-demand orchestration and scaling. So if we call that, then the infrastructure is orchestrated. We perform the call and maybe um, we wait for some time whether they are uh, for, for other additional calls uh, because then we don't have to reorchestrate again and again. Um, but after some time, we decide, okay, let's close it and shut down the infrastructure. And the nice thing is we don't pay for the infrastructure while it's deployed all the time, but only per call and real uptime. So we save some money. We can trigger functions for different events. Uh, for example, if you put a message to a service queue or via HTTP calls or time-based or when a, a database gets updated and the provider manages all the resources. Um, yeah, let's talk about benefits. Uh, now that we have these serverless functions, our DevOps team does not need to manage the resources themselves. We do not have this huge amount of technical expertise which we need. It's cost efficient as long as we don't call the function basically all the time and we have the demand orchestration. So if a function is running all the time because it's called all the time, maybe you can consider not running it as a function, as a serverless function, because this might be creating some costs. Um, I think that's interesting too, your point, because my earlier question around if there's like a scientific definition of a, a rarely invoked function, but I think it's all about you know the cost. Like if it's you'll you'll start to feel it if you made the wrong decision financially, I guess, if um, if it's an appropriate yes, sure. function or not for a serverless. And you can still wrap a a service around around a function and deploy it maybe non-serverless or use a different type of serverless, not functions, but maybe even on Azure, you have these, these app services. Um, so then the cost computation is different and maybe it's yeah. cheaper. But for now on, we just continue with the function. So the idea is that we have these functions, they are called from time to time. If they are called, then maybe even oftentimes within a short duration. And why there are no function calls, they are not orchestrated. And as soon as we have a function call, the infrastructure is orchestrated, but this orchestration takes some time. And this is called a cold start um, because we have to set up all the stuff and deploy it. And within this cold start, our function re replies rather slowly. So don't expect to have a, a nice performance there. But as soon as the function is deployed and orchestrated, um, you can call the function as often as you like and there's no cold start anymore. You have, depending on your function logic, a fast response. Um, so keep in mind that the first call is taking some time and all the others as long as uh, the infrastructure is there, are faster. So then there's a another anti-pattern, which people usually follow. When we consider this idea to break down our applications into smaller pieces of code and divide the, the concerns even more, oftentimes people ask themselves, whether we can build just anything as serverless functions. So each function is a, a different single application and then all those functions are easily developing, uh, easily developed and deployed. The problem here is that if you have a function which calls another function, the first function has to wait for the second function. And if you build your entire application or larger parts of the application this way, then you creating such huge amount of costs because all the functions have to wait for each other and 
uptime of a function is super expensive. You have slow performance because these are remote calls and remote calls are always slower than local calls. Um, for example, if you consider an, an HTTP call, that one is much slower than just a normal Python, Kotlin, whatever operation call. And again, you need to have a high technical uh, experience and also the design complexity increases because you you have to think through the, the domain to already uh, distribute all the the actions to the functions. Okay, let's Before we continue. go on, um, yeah, one question. Yeah. Uh, if there's a, uh, a walk around or a workaround uh, to ignore the cold start, which I don't think there is, but <laughs> I think that's kind of built into the whole purpose. Yeah, there. <laughs> As far as I know, there is no workaround to the cold start because you cannot approximate when your first call will be arrive. So basically, you can only orchestrate the infrastructure before the first function invocation is, is there. And as you don't know when people will invoke this function or when the other application will invoke the function, you cannot you cannot know <laughs> when you need to have the, the infrastructure deployed. And yeah, that makes sense. I've done some hacky, it. some weird hacky things around it to like kind of ping slowly ping a function, if you will. But uh, I wouldn't recommend. Yeah, that's of not course. Best practice, but then... but I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, this way. No, but you, there's. You... You can yeah. keep the function orchestrated, of course. Yes. Yeah, just a little bit, just a little po poke at it. Uh, and then Craig has a great question. Um, so, if too many functions uh, can cause performance, like, can too many functions cause performance latency or increase overall cost if you have too many of these things going? Yes, I mean, especially if they are calling each other. Um, so there are some scientific papers about that where people looked at microservice applications and usually the results are the more functions you have, it's not always a better solution then. Because with more functions, you have more remote calls and also the domain complexity is uh, the design complexity is increasing. Maybe you also increase the maintenance costs because new people have to get through all these application parts to understand how everything works together. Um, functions are quite expensive. So maybe sometimes it's cheaper to have this one application combining multiple functions running. Um, if they call each other, then there's even the question why we exclude them at all, especially if they serve the same, let's say, business purpose. So computing the overall price of an order or um, if you watch Netflix, then you are invoking around 80 microservices for one video. Wow. And if you imagine that this would be made with a lot of functions, you know that the, the amount is much higher. No, that makes sense, yeah. And uh, to follow up on the trying to work around the cold start, what about if it's time triggered? And I mean, that's, I guess, one thing I've seen before. Where it's If you like invoke the function at a certain, you know, giving a certain time or triggering it so that uh, it's still kind of warm, if you will. Uh, but that comes at a cost, as we kind of explained too. Yeah, and also I'm not sure whether cloud providers keep it orchestrated, whether they orchestrate some time before the trigger runs. I mean, they yeah. somehow yeah, I have to some... know when the time is triggered. Uh, 
that one I actually don't know how they managed that. Yeah, no worries. And then um, we got CT from South Africa, as he has mentioned earlier now. Um, is increased functions not due to the complexity inherent in the data already? So I guess it's just if your application is somewhat complex, like you will need to have increased functions. So I don't know if he's asking, is serverless a good use case or what kind of makes sense for there? I mean, there are use cases for serverless. For example, if you have, uh, if you put something in a database and then you want to perform some actions on the newly added item, then you just create a function for that, which is triggered when this item is put in the database. And there you don't have to run a, a application listening to the database because the database can throw an event which starts then the function. But not everything can be made a good use case for serverless functions. Maybe for serverless, so you can also use databases as serverless or run entire applications serverless with different services from, for example, Azure. Uh, but you always have to look at the, at the domain, at the target, what you're implementing. And I would say it's quite difficult to decide when to use what. Yeah, Which no, it makes sense. Architects are highly paid. Cool. Well, this is called create your first Azure serverless function. So I think we should definitely create a function now. I know you have a demo yes. set up, and I'll I'm going to drop these links that you have here uh, into the chat while you um, switch over. Uh, but the first one is about using the Azure functions, the documentation. I know a lot of technical people, maybe they like to you know, go to tutorials and things like that, but documentation is key to learning a lot of this stuff. Uh, that's where you get the official answers and everything. So uh, do check that one out, um, the Azure Function documentation. And then let's see here. We also have a Microsoft Learn module. So similarly to what um, Sanjo is going to show you here, but he's, it's actually kind of walking you through uh, creating uh, a service application. Uh, so all of the Azure uh, services and, and things like that. So do check that one out too. So aka.ms so that's first serverless. So that's in the chat. Uh, don't go away from us now. We're gonna. So I'm just gonna show you what he's done, and then. Uh, but do check out that later on uh, to kind of continue the the learning. If you will. Okay, so let's take a look at the demo. Before we start with the demo, I created Azure Functions with TypeScript. Uh, you can use different languages. I think C Sharp is supported for obvious reasons. Uh, Java should be supported as well. Python and also some others. Um, it's just that I like TypeScript. <laughs> so that is what I used. Um, how do serverless Azure functions look like in TypeScript? There are basically three major components which you need to consider. The one is the function.json. This part is also in some other languages available. Then you have the locals.settings.json, which I think it's also in other languages available. And you have this main source code file in TypeScript, it's called index.ts. So the function.json defines the trigger. For example, your function is triggered by an HTTP call. Uh, maybe you have also other bindings. For example, you can create a Cosmos DB binding to store items in Cosmos DB and other configurations. In the index.ts or whatever your main file is, you include the, the functions logic and parameters. It's the entry point of the function and the logic can additionally be distributed across multiple files, which we will see in a second. And the local.settings.json are all the values you require for the project to, to run it locally for the local dev environment. Um, because you can run serverless functions on your own machine for development purposes. 
So let's continue with the demo. Um, the basic idea is that we create a order function which stores items in a database. And now I just switch to the code. So I can see on my screen that you can see it. Great. You might I want to um, zoom as well. I know when you show the code, they won't be able to see it. I can already tell. So uh, if you could do like your view and then uh, expand or zoom in. Uh, yeah, sure. Just to maybe when one it's or large two. Enough. Yeah, I think click on. Yeah, I think that'd be good. I think they will. They will let us know that they can't see. Trust me. Okay. So um, yeah. I already created a project. Um, I already also thrown up some, uh, thrown, threw out some functions. You can find this project after our event on GitHub. It's under MIT license, open source. So feel free to take a look at it. Um, you don't have to write down everything which we will discuss now. So, let me just show you one function we already have included here. And then I will also give you one comment about this function. So let's just start with the function.json. Our first function, the idea is to add an order item um, using a binding. Um, so let me show you the function.json. So the first part is how it's called. So it's the trigger. We call it via an HTTP trigger. The direction is in. So when HTTP call goes in the function, the function uh, performs. <laughs> and we use the, the HTTP post verb. You can also use get whatever uh, you like, but as we store something, usually the, the semantic is to use post. And then we have this other binding for Cosmos DB, which is a database service for from Microsoft Azure. Um, so there we have a out binding. We call this binding order. And the idea is to store it in a, so Cosmos DB provides different interfaces. One is Postgres SQL, one is MongoDB. There are also Gremlin for graph databases and others. And for the binding, we use the SQL one. We have a collection, which we call orders, um, which we create if it's not there already. And we have a connection string, which the whole application here requires to authenticate. Um, for local development, we store the connection string here in the locals. Uh, local settings JSON. I think it's that one here. Don't worry, I will <laughs> invalidate all the stuff later on. So you don't destroy something. You have to change it for yourself. Anyhow, um, yeah. So let's take a look at the index.json. If you create a function, it has this function part here with the context and the request. The context contains all the it's basically an object provided to you by the Azure Functions runtime, which you can use for logging and stuff, and also for the return and getting the, the request body. Um, but you also have this request, HTTP request object here. And then the basic idea with the binding is that we usually in a function, we validate first whether we have Oh, now this, this code does not make sense anymore. Um, so let's first start with the problem with this part here. Uh, when I was building the, the application yesterday, I did not remember that this only runs for SQL databases and I deployed a MongoDB. And when I deployed an SQL database, I somehow still have the a bug that some authentication is missing. So this function here, I have to fix it after the workshop so that you can use it. But for now on, this version here does not work, but we will create other functions which will work in a second. 
Um, the best You're seeing idea. real, real non-working code here. This is as real as it gets, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone included. <laughs> yeah. So the idea is that you first validate whether your content, which you want to store, is is fulfilling all criteria, and then with this context.bindings.order, you um, you basically store the item. In this case, it's the hard-coded order item where we order noodles with quantity five and price seven on our Cosmos DB. And at the end, we return to the Coverly some, some JSON object. In this case, it's only a string. And as this does not work, we create now our own additional function, which will work. So in Visual Studio Code, you can go to the extensions. Unfortunately, my Visual Studio Code is in German, so my apologies for that. Um, and there you can search for Azure. And there are the Azure tools, which you can install. Um, and then you get this nice view here, where you can log in to your Azure account and to your Azure subscription which we don't require for now. But you also have this workspace here where you can create new functions. And uh, so here we already have a project with this one function, which is not working, but we want to have a second one. So I press this button here, which says, okay, create function. Then I have to decide which trigger I want. So let's just make in an HTTP trigger and we call it at order without binding for now. Um, you need to decide on an authorization criteria. Um, the difference between that, you better look up in the documentation. For now, we just take the anonymous so we don't have to provide some authentication. And then you can see Visual Studio Code already created us this code stub. So here we have a new folder where we have a function.json. I already throw out the get verb because it's only post. Um, it's HTTP trigger within and stuff like that. Okay, so what do we want to have next? Um, I already have deployed a Cosmos DB in Azure, you can see it here in the Cosmos DB part. You can also deploy a new Cosmos DB here via the Azure extension. And there are also some orders already, which we could take a look at later on. And the idea is that we want to store new items. Um, So I also created a additional TypeScript file for you, which uses the MongoDB, well, that one I don't need anymore, MongoDB SDK. And we have a models order, which defines how an order looks like for simple demo purposes. Uh, the Cosmos DB service, I called it, um, uses this MongoDB client and I provided you some operations there. So we can add a new order, which is validated first. If it's not valid, we throw an error. And if it's valid, then we try to insert this order to Cosmos DB. Um, for that, you need to connect first to the database, get the connection, the right, ooh, I hate these cable thingies. Um, and at the end, we close the, the connection to our database. We also have an operation which gets the orders which we will use in our second function or third, as this is the second. Um, yeah, so let's just use this add order function in our new function. We have it here. So I throw out maybe all of that for now, maybe also only that. Okay, so how do we start? We try to um, 
restore the order. So what do we need? We need to have a new Cosmos DB service. Thanks GitHub Copilot for this nice auto completion. Um, so we have an instance of our class and for the, the object we can add order where we store the order. Uh, it complaining. Ah, it's not found already there. So we have to store it with const order order which is done in request body later on. Audit. So if we just hop on Postman, which is an application where you can send HTTP requests, the idea later is that we send HTTP requests to this endpoint with a body like this, and the body is in JSON. So at the end in our function, behind this request.body, we get this thing here as an JSON object, which we store as an order. Um, so you can also this way here. Um, okay, then we add it to our Cosmos DB. And if something went wrong, we let's say we just log it for now. Context.log. We log the error. Okay, so at the end, we want to return um, order. And this thing is responding with a with an ID and it's async, so we need to await for that. We want to the ID. Is this again? Not working. <laughs> uh, yeah, live demonstrations. I mean, I, I, I admire your bravery on trying to live code this. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's always the same. OK, then we <laughs> just skip that for now. And you can see how it works in the, in the real code at the end. So we return not the, the large order, but the small. Uh, and um, why don't we know it? Ah, it's because it's in the try catch. Okay. And we return the status 201, which I think is for created. So the function should be correct now. And if we want to run it, we go back to our extension Azure's and then we choose the function without binding and you can create execute function now or just press F5. Our terminal is starting. NPM installs a lot of stuff. The function is starting. There is some logging and we know, okay, we have this add order without function endpoint. And you can see all our functions within this project are started at the same time. So we can also have multiple functions in the same container. And now we can copy this link, which I already did. That one, postman. And hopefully this works now. Okay, maybe we don't add bananas, but we add uh, soft surface studio, which has a price of I don't know. We want only one, and the price is 2,100, for example. Send it, and then going back to Visual Studio Code, we want to take a look whether it's created. Fingers crossed. Okay. Moment of Copy. truth. <laughs> I mean, the function was executing this stuff and there was yeah. no error so no errors. it should be and now there are two more of those and we have cookies we have noodles we have noodles, bananas we have bananas. the second bananas and we have the micro there it is the surface, surface studio. studio 
uh, created in Cosmos DB with our Azure function. Craig says impressive. That was impressive. And you got a second it. You got two impressive. Well done, Sandra. Well done on the live, Thanks. live coding. <laughs> okay, so maybe we take a look at another function with a binding, which is super fast written. So we create another function. We make it a time trigger function. We call it uh, maybe get orders time trigger or whatever. I'm really bad in names. And there you have to do a cron job for the demo. I would say one minute <laughs> sounds nice. So it's triggered every minute. And the idea of this function, I just closed the other stuff, is that the function is triggered every minute and we retrieve all the data from our Cosmos DB. So all of those five orders and maybe printed on the, the terminal. Okay. Um, so the binding which is created looks like this. So we have different trigger now, a time trigger. Here's the cron job. Keep in mind that one minute is the smallest amount of cron job you can do. So you cannot invoke it more than one minute, uh, more, more often than... Uh, less than one minute, I think it is. Yeah, yeah thanks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Non-native speaker, my apologies. No worries. Um, yeah. Okay. Interestingly, here's a readme <laughs> created, which was not created before for the other thing, but we don't care. Uh, okay. So again, just remove maybe again all of that. And we start again with the with the same as before. So we want to say const uh, Cosmos DB service. Copilot already knows what I would like. But interestingly, it does not perform the import. And we have, ah, <laughs> now it's more intelligent even. So we want to get all the orders from our Cosmos DB, which looks in code like that here is so super simple. We connect to the database, we get the collection, and then we find everything. So there's no query stated, put it to an array and return it. And this is stored as orders. And now we just context log, log info. Yeah, that looks nice. Um, we print it on the, the terminal as info. So hopefully this works, maybe put it in by catch. We have input output stuff here. And if something runs wrong, we just print the error, which is not a good error handling, but for the demo, I think it's okay. Okay, just run it again, F5. And I guess we have to wait one minute here. So it's starting the function. And fingers crossed that everything works. Are there questions in the meantime while we are waiting? We got a lot of, a lot of um, impressive comments. And um, let's see here. Do, do, do. I was going to put this link up as well. So if you do have any questions after the stream, and we'll also put all of the resources that we shared here uh, so uh, once the GitHub repo is ready and also the Microsoft Learn session and uh, as well as a link to this, if you want to watch it again, all on this um, tech community platform. So feel free. I, I love the, the chat, CT, Craig, Hey Unscripted, you're all connecting. So if you want to connect again, there's a good place to do that. Ask your questions, ask anything uh, from us. Uh, there would be a good place to do it. But uh, let's see, is it, is it working now? Yeah, it was <laughs> triggering. And unfortunately, GitHub Copilot was not as intelligent as I hoped. So what we forgot is to stringify the orders. So we have here object, object. Oh, um, gosh. I changed it. Gosh. I um, restarted everything. So hopefully in less than one minute, we get the real objects printed. Will the real objects please print? 
So as string, string versions. I mean, before they were basically the real objects. Now we want to have the string representation. Yes. Um, and you can see here a lot of logging is done. So there's still the the object as object, which I don't have an idea what I did wrong for now. Maybe I have to cheat a bit and take a look on my already <laughs> written code. Ah, uh, no worries. And if you want to be as good as Sandro, this is my advertisement for the create service applications. If you want to be as good as Sandro making serverless applications, check out aka.ms slash first serverless. So that's a whole learn module uh, to go walk you through some of the stuff Sandro is doing. Uh, actually building it, deploying it. Um, I forget what language, but it gives you a good overview of everything uh, that we talked about today. So you can get, you know, this is great. You've seen it, how working and sometimes not working exactly how we wanted to, but so that's uh, the realistic uh, representation, but this will give you some good uh, first steps to get you started. I, I definitely think it's a good, good session. Yeah, so actually <laughs> in my already written code, I did it this way and this also deploys, uh, prints the objects as objects. Uh, maybe I have some have to spend some thoughts and fix this bug later on. Um, but you can see the functions triggering. Yeah, and yeah, we have here working. one, two, three, four, five objects, which is the same amount than all oh, five orders here. We can also add another one during runtime. What do we want to have? Oh, there's Bot Studio. Laptop studio, isn't it? Two, oh, 12. Okay, then we buy 12 of them. 1,000. So next time there should be six objects. Six object, 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 object. Exactly. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, we were lucky. So there are already six here. <laughs> Basically, this function triggered shortly after we added them. Oh, nice. Great, great timing. Cool. Well, thanks, Sandro. This has been great, uh, giving us, like I said, the, uh, some of the concepts of serverless. I think a lot of people had those questions answered. And then also kind of the more of the hands-on stuff, too, um, which, again, it, it doesn't take too much to get this up and running. Uh, but exactly. it's good to kind of know the background, I think, of it all. Yeah, so I basically have only two slides left. Um, cool. If you require at some time functions which are calling other functions, so function chaining and stuff like that, maybe it's worth mentioning that there is one option. So just take a look at Azure Durable Functions. They are a bit differently. There are lots of good resources on Microsoft Learn. Um, if you're interested in serverless functions, it totally makes sense to Take a look at that. There are also, again, the links. Um, I'm not sure whether the slides are provided somehow. So I can, for me, it's OK if you get the slides. Yeah, and yeah, we want... will put the, the, the links in the, it's already actually on the um, the uh, tech community post. It has all the links you okay. shared. So they have, they have. Great, perfect. And if you want to connect to me, you can find me on, on GitHub. Um, you can take a look at YouTube, what I do within my research scope. You can connect to me on, on LinkedIn. Uh, you can also connect to Corey, I guess, on LinkedIn. And yeah, and I'm a raccoon I there, need... apparently. So. Yeah, you're a raccoon here. And maybe I also sent you the, the link to this repository. It's currently still private, but give me around 10 minutes after our talk and then the- Oh, the wow. Okay, will we will time you. <laughs> no okay, no so SLA here. But uh, uh, thanks everyone. Soon. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you for all the chat as well. I see a lot of connections. Uh, and yeah, do catch up with us in the, the tech communities if you do have any other questions uh, on the server list asking. And that's where all the links and everything that we will have uh, will be posted there. All right.
Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening, morning, lunch, whatever you are. Uh, it seems such a global community. And thank you, Sandra, for uh, all of this amazing knowledge. There's some good things here. CT says the raccoons look excited. Yes, they're okay, raccoons. So they are thanks excited. for having me here. And uh, I hope you had a good time. I forgot one thing to deploy it on Azure, but you can do it here with this Azure function app by creating function app in Azure, and then you can press a button to deploy it. So it's super easy. Nice. All right. Yes, we'll do it. And then we, Craig said, we'll do another, maybe do a series. So maybe more sessions. Sanjo has so much knowledge to share. So catch you later in the next year. Good, goodbye, everyone. Okay, goodbye. Bye-bye.